nowadays I, I never do that it really doesn't have much benefit this is such a random one i convinced myself that it was doing really amazing things i i don't think that that is good advice now and i would not suggest doing that hello everyone welcome back to my channel if you're new here hi my name's claire and this is yoli I make videos all about house plant care, sharing tips and tricks I've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And today's video is going to be slightly different. I'm going to go back and look at some of the house plant tips that I used to absolutely swear by, look at whether or not I still agree with them, some of the things that I've found since then that I think work better, and just generally look at what I have learned since then. So yes, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. So I'm going to be going back and looking at a video that I made two and a half years ago. It was the second ever video that I put up on YouTube about my houseplant tips that I would recommend. I haven't watched this video back since I made it. It's probably going to be slightly embarrassing, but I'm going to watch it through with you guys and I'm going to see what I agree with and what I don't anymore. So yeah, let's go. Hello everyone, welcome to anyone who's new, which is all of you. Thanks for subscribing. The intro in my first video didn't quite go to plan. Hello. <coughs> Yoli. My name's Claire and this is Yoli. I know we're just getting into the video, but I think it's fair to say that I am a lot more comfortable on camera nowadays. I find this a little bit uncomfortable and awkward to watch. I am really proud of how far I've come, but it just feels a little bit weird. <laughs> And I've started this channel to bring you weekly videos on plant care, tips and tricks, plant styling, plant styling, and much more. If this sounds like something you're interested in, then make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And there's a thing about a notification bell as well, but I can't remember what that is. If you know what I'm talking about, do that too. In this week's video, I'm going to be going through 10 really, really useful houseplant hacks that I personally wish I'd known sooner. I hope you find them useful. Use rainwater to water your plants. This is something that I heard about people doing for ages and to be honest, never really bothered to do just because it seemed like so much effort. But since I've started doing it, I've noticed plants that were almost kind of a bit dormant suddenly popping out new growth. The great thing about rainwater as opposed to tap water is that it's just got far less treatment chemicals, salts, and tap water can be really, really harsh on your plants, especially your more sensitive plants like caladiums, calatheas. I'm just going to pause this for a minute because I'm having so many thoughts already, but I nowadays do not regularly use rainwater on my plants. I tend to just use tap water. I know, like, I, I feel like I'm making some valid points here, but I think I'm probably, I'm definitely in the phase in this video where I was taking plant care maybe a little bit too seriously. I was going to a lot of extreme lengths to make sure that my plants were happy. And also at this time, I think I was very uneducated, unaware about certain things like different substrates, using the right soils, finding the right fertilizers, and kind of looking at, like, I think the purity in rainwater obviously is something that, yes, is fantastic. And if you have easy access to it, then great. But I wasn't really taking into account a lot of the nutritional factors and things that my plants actually needed to be able to thrive that come from a lot of other things besides just using pure water. And I, I do currently live in a town. I'm aware that my tap water will contain lots of chemicals and things that probably aren't amazing for my plants. But I can't say that I've noticed any of them responding particularly badly because I feel like I've really analysed that other conditions and I'm doing things in a much different way in that sense. Like I've still got very sensitive plants like certain alocasias, calatheas, some caladiums. I've still got some of those plants in my collection and I think previously I was just so freaked out about the fact that if I was to use tap water or something that wasn't kind of ultra pure then they would go downhill and as I say, maybe maybe it's different for everybody's water systems, but for me, I have not found it to be an issue. I do sometimes leave my watering can out. I fill it the night before and I leave it out so that certain chemicals and minerals can evaporate and the water is a little bit purer. But again, that's not something that I regularly, regularly do. And if I do have a plant that's struggling or seems to be responding badly to something and I can't figure out what it is, and I'm like, maybe it is tap water, then I would usually go in with distilled water as opposed to rainwater because again, it is just easier. 
Over time, it can cause a buildup of fluoride in the soil. Also, definitely worth saying that if you've got a water softener in your house, don't use this water to water your plants. That is something that I would still agree with. I know that softened water is very bad for your plants and it does contain very high levels of sodium. I think they can build up a certain tolerance to it if you're kind of introducing it over time, but if you have the option and you can use water that hasn't been treated with a water softener, then I would still definitely recommend doing that. The chemicals in water softener are really, really high in sodium and it can actually kill your plants. So would not recommend it. With the rainwater, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Literally just leave a bucket outside and let it collect. If you're fancy enough to have a water butt, then you don't need a bucket. Slightly hilarious that I didn't think people would know how to get rainwater. You can filter it, but I personally don't. And then use this to water your plants. Use a wet towel to increase humidity. At this time of year when we've got the central heating on and the air in our homes tends to be a bit drier, if you don't have a humidifier or if you just want to increase the humidity in your house a little bit more, I would recommend getting a wet towel or some sort of material that holds moisture really, really well and hanging it over your radiators. Your house still gets nice and warm, but the moisture from the towel will evaporate into the air and your plants will really thank you for it. This is something that I still actually do do on quite a regular basis and I wouldn't use it as a replacement for a humidifier. I still do use humidifiers in my house, but I always say like leaving your washing out to air dry, hanging it over radiators when the radiators are on. You can do that with also like putting cups of water on top of your radiator so that it evaporates, stuff like that. That's all really good stuff for naturally raising the humidity. And I think especially at the moment with the energy crisis and we're all kind of trying to keep the price down as much as possible it can be as I say not always a complete replacement but it can just be a really good way to kind of keep the cost low and keep the humidity high. If you don't have a humidifier this is just a really great cheap alternative to adding a bit more humidity to your house. Also leaving your clothes to air dry in general in the house helps to raise the humidity. The other thing that I didn't mention in that point that I do very regularly as well is like, for example, if I've been boiling water on the stove, I won't pour that water away straight away. I'll just let it sit. And as it evaporates, that will create more humidity in the room naturally. Lee, as I've already said, leaving your washing out to air dry is a really good one. Also things like pebble trays, which essentially kind of act in the same way. You can just put trays of pebbles. I also use lacquer sometimes under your plants or around your plants. And as the water evaporates, it's gonna naturally increase the humidity levels in your home. Squeeze your pots to improve aeration. This next one is just an alternative to what a lot of people call the chopstick method. The chopstick method is when you take a chopstick and you use it to poke holes down into the soil to basically just increase the aeration. Without good aeration in the soil, over time it will become really, really compressed. The roots won't be able to breathe properly and you'll be much more susceptible to things like root rot, which can be a killer. So this is something that I, I literally never do nowadays. I think the only time I really squeeze my nursery pots is if I'm repotting a plant and I'm wanting to ease it out of its pot. Again, as I've already said, I think at this point, I just, I hadn't done enough experimenting. I was a re in the grand scheme of things, I was a relatively new plant parent and I didn't know enough about soil, about different substrates. I think if the soil is becoming very dense and compact, then chances are you either haven't used the right mix or you haven't used the right substrates. So often nowadays, if I get a new plant in and the soil's kind of like hydrophobic or it just is not holding water well, or I feel like I need to squeeze it in order to increase aeration, then I'm not going to squeeze it. I'm going to change out its soil into something better for the plant. So yeah, yeah, it kind of in theory, it could offer a little bit more aeration in the soil, but I would definitely say change out the soil. The chopstick method is really effective, but obviously when you're poking anything sharp deep down into the soil, you risk damaging your plant's roots. And especially if you've got a plant that's quite temperamental, quite sensitive, then that's the last thing you want to do. You don't want to disturb the roots. So my method, I say my method, it's just the method I use. I don't know if I made it up. I probably didn't. Take your plant in its nursery pot and before you water it, you just give it a really, really, really good squeeze. See, even looking at that clip there that I've put in, you can, you can kind of tell why I'm having to squeeze the soil in order to kind of make it crack so that I can water it because that does not look like a good quality soil. And 
as I say, that's something that I just did not know enough about at this time, because that to me looks like when you go to kind of like, I, in America, you'd say like, I guess a big box store or a big garden center chain where they haven't really kind of taken the time to grow their plants well in substrates that are actually good for them. It just, it, it doesn't look good. That's the kind of soil that nowadays I would be, I'd be swapping out right away just to kind of loosen up the soil as much as possible. It creates the same cavity spaces in the soil, but without the risk of damaging the roots. This means that when you water, more oxygen will be pushed down into the soil. Nowadays as well, now that I do have pretty much all of my collection in what I would consider to be good quality soil, I even when it is due for a repot, like none of the soil goes that thick and clumpy. It just, it maintains its structure really well and I don't really have to worry about aeration. Keep the water from pasta, rice, eggs and vegetables. This one is so, so, so easy. Every time you've boiled eggs, boiled vegetables, boiled pasta, boiled rice, keep the water from it, let it cool down and use it to water your plants. Again, this is something that I don't regularly do nowadays, but I mean, in terms of zero waste stuff, I think it's it's definitely something you can do. The thing that I found a lot when I was when I was doing this a lot is that certain vegetables like for example broccoli water would just make my plants smell so bad like if I'd gone round with broccoli water and watered them okay yes they might have got a few extra vitamins but they would smell for literally days afterwards and I think especially when you're trying to not invite certain pests into your house it's maybe not the best option I think as well now since I found fertilizer like for example I bang on about liquid gold leaf all the time but because I found a fertilizer that I absolutely love and it does deliver my plant everything it needs this isn't kind of like an essential but I guess if you if you can't afford a fertilizer, if you just want to give your plants a little additional boost and you're wary of the vegetables you use, then it's not a bad thing to do. It's definitely not a bad thing and it does have some nutritional benefits, but it's not something that I would kind of recommend to people as much nowadays, I don't think. I mean, I have been at friends' houses before and if they've boiled up rice and they're going to just throw the water away, I have said, oh, you could use that on your plants, but it's it's just kind of an afterthought it's it's not something that i would i would recommend because it acts as a natural fertilizer with water from boiled eggs it's really really great at just adding extra calcium it's also brilliant at neutralizing the ph balance in the soil which is particularly great for plants like african violets with vegetables when they're boiled they actually release a lot of their goodness into the water that usually just gets thrown away it's just a nice little vitamin boost for them. If you use broccoli water, it does smell for a couple of days, but your plants love it. Ah, I did say that in the video. I couldn't remember whether or not I'd included that. Um, the other thing that I was going to say as well is that obviously I do always recommend using a pot that has good drainage or taking your plants out to let them drain. But if you do use water that you've, you've boiled vegetables or pasta or rice or anything like that in, the water is much less like is sorry is much more likely to go stagnant quicker and potentially mold because it obviously contains organic matter so it's even more important than it would be normally to make sure that your plants got good drainage because if not it can lead to i mean yes smelly horrible stuff pests and also mold rice and pasta are just brilliant at adding starch to the soil starch is something that your plants naturally produce and they use it as a source of energy for healthy growth a brilliant natural little fertilizer dust the leaves of your plants this one is so important i know it might be obvious make sure you're dusting your plants leaves regularly even if it's a low light plant plants need light in order to photosynthesize and if your plant is covered in dust it's not going to be able to do that this means that your plant won't be growing as quickly as maybe you'd like it to. And it's a lot more prone to certain types of pests as well. After you've given your leaves a really, really, really good dust, I always like to take a wet sponge or a wet piece of kitchen roll and just give them a good wipe just to kind of get off any other dusty residue that may have collected on your leaves. But also this is a really, really great opportunity to check for pests. So yeah, I do. This is another thing that I still to this day bang on about. Keeping your plant's leaves clean is super, super important because as I say in this video, they're otherwise not able to absorb all of the light that you're giving them and they won't be able to effectively photosynthesize. 
The one thing that I do say here is I always take a damp sponge and I wipe them over. I don't do this for all of my plants nowadays with plants that have got velvety leaves. So for example, like I'm looking at my Philodendron Splendid, but Anthurium clarinervium, Alocasia Friedeck, all that sort of stuff. I don't tend to put any moisture on their leaves whatsoever. And I've had questions about this before, people saying that in nature, their leaves are gonna get wet. So why is it any different in a home environment? And it's pretty much just because in a home environment, the airflow and air circulation is not going to be as good, obviously, as it would be outdoors in their natural habitat. And it can lead to things like fungal issues and, and things that you don't want to be dealing with on your plants. So I will just dust. I use microfiber gloves to dust nowadays, and they are absolutely brilliant. The one thing as well with dusting that I don't think I mention in here is that if you are using like I do like a microfiber glove, you just have to be really careful that you're not spreading anything from plant to plant. So doing a really thorough pest check before you start dusting is a really, really good idea and super important. Make sure you don't just do the top of the leaves, but you do underneath as well. And I tend to dust my plant's leaves probably about once a week and wipe them at least <laughs> once a month. Okay, I, I, I've, I've lapsed. I don't do it that regularly nowadays. I... I think just because, again, I've got so many plants, whenever I see dust starting to build up and I am on the whole fairly good at pest checking, then I will go and wipe them over. But there are times that my plants go weeks on end without dusting just because it takes such a long time. So yes, if you can keep it up more regularly, great, but also so long as they're not covered in layers of dust and you are managing to do regular pest checks, then I wouldn't worry that you're not doing it like every single week. Mix coffee grounds into your soil. Again, this tip is about naturally fertilizing your soil. When you've had a pot of coffee, take the leftover coffee grounds that have been boiled through, wait for them to cool down and mix them into your soil. This is fantastic at adding things like nitrogen, magnesium, phosphorus, loads of really good things to the soil. Again, at this stage, I, I don't think I knew enough about soil nutrition. I was fertilizing my plants, but I hadn't really done much research into the benefits of fertilizer and fertilizers that weren't gonna damage things like beneficial microbes, what my plants actually needed. So I was probably just going with very cheapy shop-bought fertilizer and lots of DIY on the side. And I did do the coffee thing for for quite a while. I mean, I want to say I was doing it on and off for a couple of years and I don't do it anymore at all. And the reason I stopped is just because I was noticing it was making my soil quite moldy. And again, like I said before, because coffee grounds are their organic matter and once they're hydrated and they stay damp, they are eventually gonna, gonna get moldy. So yeah, it's not something that I would nowadays recommend doing. Most plants will appreciate this, but again, African violets love it. Jade plants, philodendrons, philodendrons, I never know how you say that, philodendrons, they also really like it. <laughs> I didn't know how to say philodendron. <laughs> and I've also heard that green tea can work really well for this as well. I don't know about green tea. I don't think I ever tried that. And as I say, nowadays, I probably wouldn't. I feel quite comfortable in what I do with my plants nowadays to keep them happy and Although I do, in some senses, do quite a lot of DIY stuff, things like that, I, I probably would steer away from. Do half water changes when propagating. I am gonna make a video specifically about propagation at some point, but one thing I always get asked is if you're using the water method for propagation, how often should you change that water? Should you change it at all? What I personally do, and I found it's worked so well, is I will just do half water changes. Fun fact, this is the same advice they give you if you've got a new goldfish. I only say this because the times that I've changed the water completely, I've often sent my plants into shock. They've either died or stopped growing. If you're leaving your plants in water for months on end, it's going to get a bit green and gross. So I don't think you need to do half water changes when you propagate. Um, I, I actually still do that. I like. I don't think it's something that you need to do, but it is just a habit that I've got into. As I said about the goldfish thing in there, um, basically the principle behind that is leaving a little bit with, with fish, and I kind of just related it to plants, but is leaving a little bit of the old bacteria and their old environment in there, and then kind of adding a little bit in to kind of make the transition a little bit more gradual. 
for that reason I still do it but I don't think there's anything bad about doing complete water changes the one thing that you do have to watch out for and I think this is probably why I say when I did full water changes my plants went into shock from time to time it's really important that the water you add to your propagation is at room temperature or is kind of like very I was gonna say lightly lukewarm like not freezing cold because I think the times that I did a full water change without experimenting I probably just emptied it out put in freezing cold water and the brand new roots just went oh my goodness this is too much for me and that meant that the propagation failed but so long as you're so long as you're using something that's relatively room temperature and is what they were in before like for example if you use tap water the first time I would recommend doing tap water the second time distilled water the first time then maybe distilled again uh, but yeah I still do the half water thing but I wouldn't say it's essential I would personally recommend just doing half water changes at a time to keep the environment stable for your plants, but also making sure that the water doesn't go disgusting. Find the right soil. Again, this might be obvious, but don't cut corners with your soil. If you want your plants to do well, you need to be feeding it good stuff and the nutrients it gets are mainly from the soil. I said in my last video the combination that I tend to use, I mix it up a little bit sometimes, but as a general rule of thumb, I tend to use houseplant soil, coconut core, I looked up how to say core, it is core. Uh, firstly, it's, I've recently learnt that that word is pronounced coir, not core, but I've been saying core all this time. Um, and I find it quite funny that I'm talking about soil here and I'm saying that good good quality equals the mix that you use. And actually that's more about texture and that's more about replicating what the plant's natural substrate would be. So for example, if you look at monsteras or philodendrons or just kind of like aroids in general, they tend to prefer a much chunkier mix. So bark and stuff like that. It really does vary depending on the plant, but the thing that I just very casually say here is like, just use houseplant soil. Houseplant soil is like, it's such a, a broad kind of like umbrella term. You can pick up houseplant soil online for like two pounds a bag and it's not necessarily going to be good quality stuff. Like the, the thing that my ficus tinnicky that I showed you in the video where I was like squeezing the pot earlier in this one, that was houseplant soil that it was potted in, but it was very bad quality houseplant soil. So yeah, it's just, I, I mean, nowadays I try to use stuff that hasn't been treated or sterilized or used with any, like any nasty chemicals or anything like that to kill off, again, things like beneficial microbes. I personally use Soil Ninja and I absolutely love their mixes. I do still like mixing my own soil. I'm definitely not as precious about the measurements of my mixes nowadays. I just free pour my perlite, my sand, my grit, whatever I'm using, but, um, but yes, that's definitely something that I've learned and just houseplant soil doesn't mean that it's going to be good quality, even if the mix is right. Perlite and citrus soil. The blends that I use is probably about 40% houseplant soil and then 20% measures of core perlite and citrus soil. I also don't know why I was just randomly adding in citrus soil to my mixes. I, I, I mean, I don't know why I was doing that. I don't know if I... Why was I doing that? I genuinely don't know because again it depends on the plant and it depends on the nutrients that that plant needs so that's something that I definitely don't do nowadays. I've played about with so many different types of soil mixes and this is just one that I found works really well for me so if you're not quite sure then I would recommend this mix. So nowadays, if I'm just creating like a base mix, as I say, I do buy a lot of my base mixes pre-mixed, but I would tend to do, if I'm not quite sure about what the plant would like and I haven't had a moment to research it, I'll tend to use Soil Ninja's just like standard base mix. I'll mix in some perlite, some orchid bark, some horticultural charcoal, and on the whole, that's that tends to be it. I, I can get fancy and add other things in as well if if I'm feeling fancy, but that tends to be just kind of like my standard mix nowadays. For cacti and succulents, I use more or less the same, but I replace the houseplant soil with a specific succulent soil and add some extra sand or grit to help with drainage. Um, and again, with my succulents and cacti nowadays, I don't tend to use a specific succulent and cacti soil. I again will use a base mix and I'll just mix lots of grit and sand and stuff like that in so that it's really well draining.
Make sure you turn your plants. This next tip is turn your plants regularly. Again, your plants need an even amount of light all round in order to photosynthesize, even if they are low light plants. And if they're just getting that from one side, then their growth is gonna be really, really uneven. They're gonna just be like, so I would still say this with certain plants, like for example, I've got a snake plant behind me in this video and yes, I would turn something like that. But with a, like, for example, my um, big variegated monstera just there, as you can see, all of its growth is growing one way towards the light. And I very, I mean, I never turn that plant because I like the way that it's growing. Because all of its leaves are facing the light, it means that it's able to absorb all the light from that angle. And unless I wanted complete 360 growth, I've really got no reason to turn that plant. So if you're, if, like, if you're working with a vining plant, then I would say it's completely up to you. It is just down to personal preference. And if you are working with like a working with, I don't know what I'm saying working with, if you are talking about a plant like, I don't know, an aglaonema or something like that, or a snake plant that does tend to have growth that isn't, isn't just kind of like prone to going in one direction, then yes, I would turn it. But otherwise I've got a lot of plants in my collection that I never turn and I'm just happy with the way that they're growing and they seem happy as well. On average, I would probably recommend turning them once a month, but if you notice they're starting to grow towards the light before then, then just give them a little spin. Use hair to add nitrogen to the soil. This is a bit of a weird one. In terms of adding nitrogen to the soil again, you can actually use hair to do this. It can be animal hair or human hair. If you take it out of your brush, obviously make sure that it's not full of like conditioner or oil or product or whatever. This is such a random one. And I read this online. When did I like, maybe it was during lockdown and I was like, oh my goodness, what an amazing tip. And I started doing it all the time for all of my plants. And I think I convinced myself that it was doing really amazing things, but in reality, it is gonna take years and years and years for that hair to decompose. So. I mean, I guess a benefit of doing something like that, I'm kind of stepping away from the nitrogen thing here, but a benefit of adding, I wouldn't recommend doing it, but if you did want to add like animal hair to your soil or something like that, is that it could potentially help with drainage because obviously it will help to increase the aeration in the soil. There's lots of other things that you could use instead of that, but nowadays I, I'd never do that. And I definitely would not recommend doing that because it really doesn't have much benefit. And again, earlier in this video, I completely forgot to reference it, but I said about boiling eggs and using that water because it's got calcium and stuff like that. I know another big kind of hack that was going around for a while was breaking eggshells into your soil to release calcium. And it's the same principle. It's gonna take them such a long time to decompose that by the time they even start to decompose, your plant will be ready for a repot. So I don't know, it kind of, I, I don't think that that is good advice now and I would not suggest doing that. But you mix this into your soil and as it decomposes, it releases nitrogen and gives your plants a boost. Plants that love nitrogen are Diffenbachia, Dif Diffenbachia, I don't know how you say it, dumb cane. God, I know my plant pronunciation isn't amazing now, but it was so bad here. I'm also aware that I did just refer to Diffenbachia as dumb cane and I know that you shouldn't say that. I've learned a lot in the last couple of years and I will continue to learn, but just saying, I know I shouldn't have said that. And philodendrons, philodendrons, philodendrons. I don't know which one is which, but both of them appreciate higher levels of nitrogen in the soil. I really hope these were useful. So just as an overview, I, I think there were some areas in there that I do, I do still agree with. I think I would change elements of pretty much everything I said. I think I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of experimenting. I've done a lot of, oh, wow. I just spilt my tea everywhere. Whoopsie. I've done a lot of figuring things out with my plants since I filmed that video a couple of years ago. I've obviously now been doing YouTube a lot more and I've, do, I've been doing a lot more experimenting on camera and kind of logging what works and logging what doesn't quite so much. And I do actually find it very useful to have references like that from when I first kind of started doing this so that I can look back and go, oh, okay, well, my opinions really changed on this. And maybe a few years down the line, I'll be saying that about my videos now. I, I kind of, in a way, hope that I am because 
I feel like I'm figuring out better things to do for my plants all the time and I like continuing to grow with that knowledge and a lot of the time that does mean making mistakes but yeah I um I quite enjoyed reacting to that I I hope you found it useful I hope you've taken something away from this video and if you'd like me to do more like this then please do let me know because I'd be more than happy to do so but if you did enjoy this video please make sure to give it a thumbs up subscribe to my channel have a lovely day and I will see you in the next video